The thrust belts found on the outside of major collision mountain belts often have stunning topography where we can characterise the surface geology very well. But as structural geologists, we want to interpret the subsurface. So in this presentation, we're going to look at subsurface interpretation of a fault thrust belt, and we can contrast three interpretations, which have been constructed using different approaches. And these carry different implications, not only for the structure of the thrust belt itself, but also for the stratigraphy and its arrangement that existed before thrusting. And we're going to explore the choices that a structural geologist needs to make when constructing cross sections. So we're going to look at an example from the Western Alps, where the thrust belt is developed from stacked Mesozoic strata that are a limestone shell sequence, so it's a carbonate-rich succession. It's also emergent, in other words, the thrusts and folds interacted directly with the Earth's surface rather than form beneath a roof of uh, overriding thrust sheets. And the deformation is Miocene, or indeed late Miocene in age, uh, so relatively recent. And the whole system is believed to be detached from the underlying basement, so is a classic example of a so-called thin-skinned thrust belt. So this is where we're talking about. It's the subalpine fold thrust belt of uh, this part of France. The thrust belt as a whole lies between the uh, city of Geneva on the French Swiss border down to the town of Crest down there in the uh, southeast corner of the map. And on this map, the blue and green colours represent Jurassic and Cretaceous strata respectively. The yellow uh, is largely Miocene and Pliocene in age um, deposits that accumulated before thrusting and have been caught up subsequently in the thrust system. And we're going to be looking at part of this thrust belt, the Chartreuse area there in the middle. It lies just adjacent to the thrust front, the edge of the deformation of this part of the Alps, um, with the foreland area lying beyond. And here we are in the photograph looking out from the Chartreuse hills towards the foreland and the deformation front, which are there. So it's a spectacular area. The hills rise to about two kilometres above sea level, and this landscape is cut by deep gorges, which provide natural cross-sections to characterise the surface geology. So what about the rocks themselves? Well, the more outlying systems in here consist of about a kilometre, maybe up to a kilometre and a half, of platform carbonates that were deposited upon basement, and they're capped unconformably by Miocene deposits, and that contact is an erosional unconformity. However, if we go further east, that's more in away from the thrust front, the stratigraphy expands. It expands particularly in the Jurassic, where it is very shaly. And the uppermost Jurassic and Cretaceous rocks consist of thick carbonates separated by thick shale-dominated successions, so it becomes more of a multi-layer. Again, the succession is eventually capped by these uh, Miocene uh, deposits. So that's the stratigraphy. And a key marker in the stratigraphy is the youngest major carbonate platform unit termed Ergonian. It's essentially Beremian in age within the upper part of the lower Cretaceous. And it forms these spectacular cliffs in the landscape. So looking back into the Chartreuse hills from near the thrust front, uh, we can see these repetitions of the platform carbonates term the Agonian, and those cliff sections in there are 250 metres high at times. So a prominent marker, a key bed within our uh, stratigraphy. And so we'll see it feature in some of the cross sections. So our cross sections will lie in this direction here principally, which is broadly west-northwest, east-south-east, We'll look at three different cross sections, more or less along the same section line, although there are slight variations, and they're all oriented with west to the left and east to the right. So let's look at the first one. And here we go. This is a cross section put together by Jean-Louis Mounier and others uh, from the University of Grenoble in 1987. And it shows the Argonian in that orange colour the key marker horizon. You can see that around the outcrop areas there, the top of the profile, that it occurs several times, as we saw in the landscape. The other key marker that you picked out on this profile is the uppermost Jurassic limestone unit, the Tithonian, in here. 
You'll also see that there's basement involved on the right hand side of the section, that's in the east where it comes to outcrop, but we're not really worried about this. Beneath the thrust belt, these guys interpret the basements to lie undeformed at depth and that the thrust belt is thin skinned. So let's think about how this section's been constructed. And it's been constructed with fault bend fold theory. In other words, that the folds in here are simply a consequence of movement up shaped thrust faults climbing uh, from flats to ramps and up onto upper flats. The fold limb dips reflect the ramp angles at which thrusts climb through the stratigraphy. But let's just look at the central part of this cross section now, where there's some steep dips. In order to explain these steep dips at outcrop, the interpretation requires multiple thrusts at depth, so that the steep dips are formed incrementally by the stacking of one thrust slice upon another. And if we go to the outcrop, we see these steep dips actually occur, um, dipping here at about 60 or 70 degrees uh, in a quarry. Well, this idea is implicit in the antiformal stack model for imbrication. So let's step back out to the cross section. Drawn by fault bend fold theory, the folds represent the ramp angles. Where we have steep dips, we have to invoke multiple thrust stacks on top of each other. The virtue of this method is it's very simple to apply. It's got a very small palette of structural styles. And it's restorable. In other words, we can do an audit of the material seen in the final state section at the top and pull it out to account for it in its pre-deformation state. And it restores with bed length conserved between the pre- and post-deformation states. It's a bed length restoration. A structural style which involves thrust detachments, thrust flats in other words, which run parallel to stratigraphy, connected by steep ramp segments. Well, let's compare this model with another cross section drawn through the same ground some years later. And it too uses thrust detachments and ramps as the structural palette. And here it is. The section was drawn by Eric de Ville and William Sassy, published in 2005. They've shown some structure in the basement in here, um, but that doesn't get involved. It's just passive in the cross section. Let's look at the colour scheme. So in this cross section, the Ergonian has not been broken out. It's just incorporated into the Cretaceous, which is shown generally as green on the cross section. The upper Jurassic marker here, shown in light blue, is equivalent to the Tithonian marker used by the Munier et al. section that we were looking at just now, and the older Jurassic units lying beneath. This cross section is also restored, and here is their restored template. Now it looks a little strange, and that's because the cross section at the top has been arbitrarily terminated at its eastern margin with a vertical line. So when you restore all the units, they don't restore to the same length. So you can see that the green Cretaceous rocks and the upper Jurassic restore right across the cross section, but the middle and lower Jurassic rocks don't reach that far because they would have continued at depth, but they've just been arbitrarily terminated. And that's even more apparent with the basement rocks. Nevertheless, that's a true audit of the cross sectional area of rocks seen in the cross section and on the restored template. So it's got some significant differences from the Mooney et al. section. The key one is that there's only one floor thrust, one level at which the thrusts are detaching from, and that's at the base of the lower Jurassic. It does have ramps, and they climb across the stratigraphy, as shown on the restore template. The other key feature about this cross section is the stratigraphy doesn't change very much across it. It's almost layer cake. There's a gradual expansion as you go from left to right, and the green rocks as indeed the Cretaceous rocks in the Mooney et al. section, are truncated as you go towards the west on the restored template uh, by the unconformity at the base of the Miocene. But that doesn't affect the structural geometry. So this cross-section is simplified compared to the Mooney et al. And it's worth thinking why. Well, the paper by de Ville and Sassy deals with thermal modelling to try and forecast the maturation state for hydrocarbons in lower Jurassic rocks uh, on the section. 
And so they needed a version that was simple enough to forward model. In other words, take the restore template and by assuming a sequence of thrusting, just stack the thrust slices up and look at the burial history and hence model the thermal evolution of the thrust belt. So the cross-section was constructed for a very specific purpose and consequently carries many simplifications, which means that the forward model can progress simply. So the, the question is, how well does the cross-section at the top represent the geology that we see at outcrop? Well, here are cross-sections from published geological maps um, for the Chartreuse area that were constructed without any particular agenda or trying to follow particular structural styles. And they show a wide variety of fold thrust relationship, including some rather strange fold geometries. Let's just look at the lower section, which comes from the Grenoble uh, geological map. And here is an outcrop photograph of one of these folds. So these folds uh, are there. Uh, this one is in the Tithonian. It's the light blue uh, layer on the cross section. And we can see that we've got folds in here, which clearly are not simply related to uh, thrust faults. And so there's clearly another folding component in here that is not simply as a response to thrust geometry at least in the eyes of the guys who drew these cross-sections. Yeah, let's also return to another aspect of variation across the Chartreuse, and that relates to the stratigraphy. So as we saw at the start, the strat varies systematically across the region, from a platform-dominated rather thin succession, the so-called Jura stratigraphy in the west, expanding up to a multi-layer of separated carbonates and shales with a radical increase in thickness to several kilometers in the eastern part of the Chartreuse. So can we capture these variations in structural style and stratigraphy and still deal with them in cross sections? Well here's a cross section that I put together quite a long time ago now that attempts to do just that. It captures the variable folding and the varying stratigraphy as documented at outcrop. So the challenge is to incorporate stratigraphic complexities, potentially pre-existing structures that have controlled these stratigraphic complexities, and more complicated localization of deformation rather than just concentrate on um, fault bend fold theory, for example. Well, here's the restoration. So it does restore. The way the section's been restored has been pulling out the Ergonian marker, which is the orange unit on here, as a key bed, and then rehanging the stratigraphy from it um, to reconstruct the stratigraphic template to honor the stratigraphic thicknesses as illustrated on the cross section. And they're complex fold thrust relationships in here. As arrowed on the cross section, we can see we've got a steeper forelimb in the frontal, so called rat's anticline there towards the west, and rather complicated um, shavings in the fold structure arrowed to the right there. So there's distributed deformation, not just simple thrust displacement, implied by the structural styles that we see in the interpretation at the top. And these are identified by these shaded areas on the restored template. In here, bed length is not necessarily conserved, but the cross-sectional area of these formations is. So there's a distributed strain component alongside fault slip that is responsible for the structures that we see here. So complex fold thrust relationships that we can incorporate onto the template and represent in the final state cross-section. But there's also stratigraphic variation in here. Consider the thickness variations that exist within the lowermost Cretaceous rocks, which lie between the blue Tithonian marker and a darker green Valanginian uh, limestone unit. And here it is in these two anticlines here. But let's compare these thicknesses with this very expanded section that lies in this structure further to the east. We can represent these on the restored template. So here is the thin succession of lowermost Cretaceous, and there's the expanded section. And you'll notice that the explanation adopted here is that increase in thickness in the lowermost Cretaceous rocks occurs because of a normal fault in here, which has increased accommodation space 
over on the right hand or eastern side of the section and even that that normal fault may have localized the subsequent thrust ramps that have stacked up the area. So we can incorporate stratigraphic variation in this section. So a rather more complicated interpretation than we've seen in the other two. So let's compare these now. The Mounier et al section draws its structures from a rather simple style palette, just fault bend folding. The advantage of that is it's very simple to draw the cross section. It's a routine method uh, that uh, many people could adopt and generate rather similar looking cross sections. The de and Sassy section also has a very simple star palette. In many ways it's simpler because it only has one detachment horizon from which the thrusts are climbing. Again, it has a routine section construction method and has the additional benefit of being able to generate a forward model that can be used to forecast the burial history and therefore the thermal history of the thrust belt, uh, which in turn can be used to deduce the timing of structures related to hydrocarbon maturation. An important thing if you're into oil exploration in thrust belts, where timing is all. But we can contrast these two versions with this final one, which has a structural star palette that's greatly expanded and is specific to the observations you can make at outcrop for this area. It therefore honours the structural styles that we see in outcrop, as well as the stratigraphic variation that we can gain from measuring sections uh, on the ground. So it captures variety, but is therefore far more complicated than the other two versions in here. Now that may well be a better representation of the natural world, but it means that it's far less easy to use it for other purposes, such as forward modelling. And it also means that multiple interpreters will generate multiple interpretations. So it's hard to create a routine workflow for this type of cross-section approach. Every case will be different. So the approach we adopt to draw cross sections depends on the purpose, you know, as the aim of the exercise. But the solution we get also therefore depends on this. If we want to understand thermal modeling, then a simple model may be adequate. But if we want to look at displacement patterns on individual structures or even across the whole region, if we want to understand the mechanical behavior and forecast smaller scale structures, and if we want to constrain subsurface structure carefully, then we need to understand the variety of structures and the simplifications we make may compromise these ambitions. Furthermore, if we want to understand the stratigraphic architecture that existed before thrusting, we have to incorporate structural complexity in our interpretations. And most of the existing approaches that use routine workflows that are embedded in, for example, software packages are incapable of this type of sophistication. So that's a quick look at how we can contrast three interpretations, each drawn for different purposes across a thrust belt. These different approaches generate different implications for structural geology in the subsurface and in the evolution of the geometries that we interpret. And also for the architecture and arrangement of the stratigraphy, the rocks that existed before the deformation. It's important when making these choices, we do so with our eyes open, so we understand the implications of these choices. And we have to be particularly careful if we use cross-sections to deduce things for which they were not originally intended.